Uh, welcome to the BioXL webinar number 72. And today with us is Tom Aller from AstraZeneca. I'm Alessandra Villa from the Royal Institute of Technology. With me is to, uh, Otto Anderson from the Finnish IT Center in Finland. Uh, Thomas will speak about computational chemistry workflow with cycles and condition using mites. So the webinar just will be recorded. And during the webinar, you are most welcome to ask questions. To ask questions, you have to use the Q&A function that is on the bottom of your Zoom panel. And you might have this, this symbol or this symbol, depending on the operating system that you have. You can click there, type your question, and uh, the question will be read by one of us at the end of the webinar. And, uh, but you have also the possibility to ask yourself the question. So just writing uh, if that you want uh, to, that we activate your microphone, or if you don't want, you write no microphone. We also had something new this time. So we have, we have an after webinar. So after the webinar, there will be in askbioxcel.eu, that is the Bioxcel forum, a category dedicated to this webinar, where you can go on for one week to ask questions to Thomas about this webinar. So please go to check there for after the webinar. Some things are about Thomas. Thomas is currently a senior scientist in the molecular AI group at AstraZeneca. He's working combining physics-based approach to protein ligand binding with generative machine learning models. He got a PhD in the Center for Misfolding Disease at the University of Cambridge, and where he was using computational methods to study kinetic and thermodynamic of disorder protein. He has also contributed to the development of open source software like Plume, uh, that is a software for enhanced molecular dynamic simulation. And now I will give, stop sharing and give the word to Tomax, please. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and the invitation. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, our efforts to build a, a workflow manager to handle uh, more complex workflows, such as workflows uh, containing cycles and conditions. And uh, the motivating um, uh, factor for this is really the integration of physical methods and generative machine learning models. So first I'll give you a bit of a uh, sort of motivational introduction in terms of uh, early stage drug discovery and how we can use generative models for it. And then how this implies a need for uh, a more advanced workflow management system. And I will talk a bit about how you can use maze in practice, how it, how it looks like, what is implemented, um, and some basic capabilities. So machine learning crops up in all parts of, of drug discovery and the drug discovery process. So um, of course we have uh, late stage development, clinical development, where machine learning methods are also routine, but also of course early discovery. So uh, target identification and uh, initial drug design. And I'm going to focus on, on drug design today and the department I'm working in at, at AstraZeneca, it's the Molecular AI Group. And uh, we have sort of three main focuses. We, uh, first of all, we're working on uh, synthesis prediction. So given a small molecule, how can we um, find an ideal synthesis route for this in an automated way? Uh, then uh, de novo molecular design. So uh, coming up with completely new um, molecular structures that are drug-like and could be good drug candidates. And then the third pillar, and this is sort of the, the sub-team I'm working on, is sort of the physics-informed um, uh, screening aspect. And this is very uh, tightly integrated with the de novo molecular design uh, efforts, because um, if we come up with a new drug compound, we want to be able to evaluate it um, as efficiently as possible. So the, the core really of, of the drug discovery process in the early stage is the design, make, test, analyze cycle. So generally, we'll, a drug discovery process 
uh, project starts with a drug target. So some kind of protein that is implicated in the disease and will typically have some kind of initial uh, hit compound that is a starting point for us. And this hit compound will often be uh, not very active or maybe unselective, has some uh, not so nice toxicological properties. And we want to get to a, a candidate drug, uh, which is more potent, has um, a good side effect profile, and um, is generally as effective as possible. And uh, between these, in that, in that process, we go through this design, make, test, analyze cycle. And so we um, design, come up with a design for uh, a molecule, uh, synthesize it, test it in some assay, and then analyze the results and uh, use that to inform the next iteration of this cycle. So um, how can we make this faster? And so what we're working on uh, in, in my group is, is a lot of um, de novo molecular design, as I mentioned before, so coming up with new structures, synthesis prediction, and uh, what is also done in, at AstraZeneca is, is automation to make the test and analyze steps as efficient as possible. And I'm not going to be uh, talking about those today. So de novo uh, molecular design is, is sort of a fairly new field and it's really been uh, made possible by innovations in machine learning especially. And so I think a lot of you are now familiar with uh, large language models and uh, actually the, the main uh, software that, uh, that was developed in-house and is, and is available uh, for this purpose called reInvent is actually based on sort of the ideas in language models. And so what we can do is we can take a, a small molecule like this example here and we can use the smiles representation which is basically just a string representation of this molecule. And uh, smiles codes have a have already can be seen as a language in some sense. So they have a specific syntax and, and grammar to it. And this means we can use the, the, the power of, of language models and apply them to this task of generating small molecules. And this uh, is done in, in our case with recurrent neural networks, which are a bit of an older method, but they work really well in this case, actually. The idea is we can sample from this recurrent neural network after it's been trained on a suitable set of drug-like molecules, for instance, and uh, eventually build up our small molecules. So in this case, where we get to this, this probability vector and we sample from this probability vector, and in this case, we're sampling an oxygen atom. And then depending, because we sample an oxygen atom, we have a, a certain other probability distribution of a second iteration, Will be a double bond, and then eventually we can build up our small molecule by sampling from the output of this neural network, and we get something that is a drug-like molecule. And it might look something like, uh, like what you see on the right side. So this tool is called uh, reInvent, and uh, it's really the, the core of, of our uh, de novo design efforts. And as I just mentioned, the idea is we, we propose some new chemical structures. But ideally, what we want to do is we want to uh, get some kind of uh, idea of how good those small molecules are at a particular task. So for example, binding to a particular drug target. So what we want is some kind of scoring function that evaluates them and then feeds those scores ideally back into the generative model so that at the next iteration, the generative model can produce a better set of compounds. And this process is called reinforcement learning. And you might have heard of this in, in many other um, sort of high profile machine learning projects. And so the advantage of this is that uh, instead of um, screening for existing libraries, which might have um, a few billion compounds at most, we can actually screen a much, much larger uh, section of chemical space and the, the number that gets thrown around for chemical space is 10 to the 60 compounds. Um, and of course, a lot of that depends on how the model is trained, but uh, we can definitely generate many compounds that have never been seen before. So in theory, this gives us a lot of flexibility in our, in our drug discovery process. And you can see this reinforcement learning at play if you use uh, docking as a scoring function 
And in this case, you can see the docking score on the y-axis and the epoch on the x-axis. And you can see that the uh, model over time learns to create compounds that have a more uh, favorable docking score. So the idea now, of course, is that we want to go a step further with, with this scoring process. So docking is, is quite nice, but it's also not uh, necessarily the most accurate way of determining the binding energy of a small molecule to a, a protein target. And a far more uh, accurate approach, but also very computation expensive one, is our, our relative binding free energy calculations. And these have been used uh, by us quite, um, quite extensively. And they generally correlate fairly well with, with experimental binding free energy. So they, they're a great tool to make well-informed decisions on which molecules to prioritize for synthesis, for example. But of course, to we would like to have this kind of scoring in a loop with the with the generative model I've just mentioned. The problem is that uh, RFP calculations are quite slow, and, and and they can take several hours for a single uh, for a single compound over the difference between two compounds, whereas docking can be done in in seconds to minutes. So there's a nice way of sort of uh, making this process a bit more efficient and that is active learning. So the idea behind active learning is that we can uh, take a, a subset of the compounds we want to score. So say we have some kind of large library of 20,000 compounds, we can select uh, just a few hundred or so. We can do uh, an RBFE calculation on just uh, this subset. And then we can take those uh, scores that we got and train a machine learning model to predict the scores for all the other compounds that we didn't sample. So if we select our subset wisely and the machine learning model is sort of, um, in this case, it's a domain specific machine learning model. So it doesn't have to be transferable. So it can be quite, quite effective. And we can actually significantly improve this, this process. And we can uh, get away with only doing a few hundred free energy perturbation simulations, for example, um, and thus saving hundreds of thousands of hours potentially of, of compute time and making this whole process a lot more efficient. So this is sort of the, uh, some motivation for, for um, having some strong way of, of combining all these, all these models together. Um, we want a, some efficient way of doing this. And so this is where a workflow manager comes in and this is where we're going to a more uh, sort of more to the engineering side of, of this whole process. So why would you want to use a workflow manager? Well, first of all, um, you can you can really make a lot of gains in terms of reproducibility of your of your scientific workflows. Uh, if it's a, a very standardized way of, of running them, then uh, that makes things easier, not just for yourself, but also others who want to replicate your workflow. Then another aspect is configuration. If you can separate the configuration of your software with that of your workflow or your, your actual scientific workflow, it makes it very clear which parameters are for your workflow and which ones are just there because you're running on a particular machine somewhere. Uh, then, of course, you can gain a lot in terms of modularization because many components you're using in workflows will be uh, reused in other parts and you don't have to rewrite them again or uh, share code in some other way. Then it can be a lot easier to, auto to automate these workflows because the interfaces can be kept very consistent. And also there's the concept of abstracting away very complex workflows in uh, so that you can really focus on the essence of, of your workflow and don't have to worry about details for some particular step that have been already fleshed out before. And then finally, there's some, there's some uh, hope that you can actually parallelize quite significant parts of your workflow and um, thus make your, your whole uh, uh, setup more, your whole pipeline a bit more efficient. And so you can see here is sort of an example workflow that is 
a very typical, I think, in molecular simulation. Say you want to simulate a protein with a ligand. You would have some step of preparing the ligands and preparing the protein. This can be run in parallel. So there's some efficiency saving here. Uh, you set up your system, you minimize, you equilibrate, you simulate the system, you analyze. So this is a very a typical setup. And uh, these steps can sort of be seen as, um, we can abstract them away to, to boxes that look like this, basically. So this is a very typical use case you might be familiar with, but it's actually not entirely what we want to do, I think, in many cases, because we might do our analysis at the end and then find ah, this is not actually converged. We need to run a bit longer. And in this case, you actually immediately have a cycle in there, and that's where existing workflow managers break down because basically not none of them can actually run uh, a circular workflow like this. And so this, these uh, graph structures you just saw, um, they can be classified as directed acyclic graphs or directed cyclic graphs. In the directed acyclic graph, we have a very linear workflow. So uh, any node just depends on the nodes that came before it and then that came after it. Whereas in the directed cyclic graph, you can see that node B actually depends on node A, but also downstream node D. So uh, there's a cycle in here which um, cannot be easily modeled with the ways that uh, workflow managers running directed acyclic graphs um, run graphs. So there are certain algorithms that are very optimized for directed acyclic graphs um, that cannot be applied to directed cyclic graphs because they depend on this ordering. And so there's quite a lot of software that can run directed acyclic graphs, uh, some uh, larger uh, pieces of software, Airflow, uh, Luigi. And on the other hand, directed cyclic graphs, there's not very much I've found actually that, can, that could do this, that we could base our workflows on. And the only big one I found is, is ACA, which is written in Scala and has a bit of a different, uh, different use case. So what do we want out of our workflow manager? So uh, I think I mentioned these, uh, these things before, so but it's uh, what we wanted mostly is um, a reproducible system. And we wanted this to be written in Python because all our other software is, is written in Python and it's an excellent language for, for scientific computing. And we wanted these workflow definitions to be very simple and portable. Uh, so you can easily run them on other systems. And that sort of goes into the next point of configuration. We wanted to keep the configuration for the system you're running on completely separate from that of a workflow. So as long as your system is configured correctly in terms of what software it can use and what is available in terms of libraries and so on, then you can just take a workflow and run it on, on that system without any changes to the workflow. And we wanted some way of uh, modularizing our workflows, of course. So we want to be able to reuse uh, workflow nodes and we can do that by giving them very well-defined inputs and outputs uh, so that they can just be put together like Lego pieces. And of course, we wanted some ways of automating this. So good interfaces to excellent software, for example, we can use this in Jupyter notebooks, for example. And uh, a very big point uh, here is also the uh, some way of abstracting uh, um, sub workflows into what I'm calling subgraphs. So the idea is you can group many nodes together to form a subgraph, which in turn acts just like a normal node in a workflow would, which means you can uh, build up workflows hierarchically by combining very small steps together and then abstracting them into one big step and then use those bigger steps in a larger workflow. And you can do this arbitrarily deeply. And this makes, I think, it, I think makes it easier to reason around very complex workflows that inevitably crop up in, in computational chemistry. And finally, it would be nice to have parallelization by default. So um, being able to run all these steps in parallel and let them uh, communicate with each other. And this brings me to, to what I used as a basis for this uh, whole system, and that is the uh, concept of flow-based programming, which is 
something that was initially discovered, I think, in the or, or invented in the in the 80s, but then never really caught on. Uh, but I think it's a very elegant way of, of solving this problem because the idea here is that each node in your workflow graph is just running uh, a single system process. So all nodes in your system are running at the same time, but they all communicate with each other through uh, specific channels based on how you connected them. So one, uh, one node can send data through its output port and some other node will receive this data and can do some processing with it. And so every node just waits for data to be received or does some processing and then sends it on and then can do something else. And the advantage of this is that you, uh, you can now execute any kind of graph structure. You can be, have arbitrary cycles or some kind of conditional execution, uh, but also all nodes are running at the same time, which means uh, everything is paralleled by default. And you can, by just very, by being very strict about what the nodes are sending and receiving, you can completely avoid any problems like race conditions that you might normally have if you're trying to run uh, software in parallel. So this allows us to solve uh, quite a few problems and gives us some um, interesting patterns that we can implement that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. And so the first one I can, I can show you is on the left side and that's uh, uh, batch processing. So we have some kind of long list of data that we want to process through two compute nodes, compute A and compute B. And the way we can do this is we can uh, chunk our data into, into batches and uh, send our first batch to compute A, which will process it, send it to compute B and process it and uh, send it onwards. But say we have uh, compute node A is, is some kind of process that only runs on the CPU and compute B is something that only runs on the GPU. This means we can uh, be far more efficient with our data by doing this because while compute uh, B is running the second batch on the GPU, compute A is, is running, um, sorry, the compute B is running the first batch on the GPU, compute A is running the second batch on the CPU to prepare for compute B. So we can have uh, far more efficient use of resources by, by doing this. Similarly, you might have software that uh, you have two GPUs in your system and your software can only use one GPU at a time. What you can do is you can uh, parallelize your system in such a way that you have two compute nodes doing the same thing, just running on separate GPUs, for example, and you can split your data and uh, send some of it to the first node and the other half of it to the second node and let them do their computations and then merge your results. And finally, the, the problem I mentioned earlier with, with having some kind of, uh, for example, convergence check is essentially just iteration. So we have some kind of uh, compute process happening and we want to check if we're done. And if we're done, we just go out of the loop, that's fine. And if we're not done, we send it back to the compute node and we can um, merge our results data. So this is sort of an example of, of what you could do if you had a, a simulation uh, running and you wanted to do a convergence check. So this brings me back to, to active learning. So the, the idea here is, um, as mentioned before, we have some kind of uh, library or um, generator in our case. So some way of, of generating small molecule candidates. And we send them to, uh, we sample from this generator. And um, before we actually run this whole thing, we have some kind of, I'm assuming we have some kind of model that is trained to predict scores, even if it's not in a very efficient way. Uh, but we have, we send it to, send some, some samples, say a thousand structures from reInvent. We send them to this model that predicts scores. And then based on these scores, we can select a subset, say a hundred, and those hundred are sent to the so-called Oracle, which is the expensive function that we actually want to model. So the Oracle can do this calculation on a subset of hundred compounds. And the 
uh, scores that it calculated or the, the free energy of binding, for example, that it calculated can be sent back to the, to the model and the model can be retrained with this data. And at the same time, of course, we merge these results that we got from the Oracle, say the 100 with the other 900 that we, um, that we got from the, uh, from the cheat model and feed these scores back to, in this case, reInvent, so the uh, reinforcement learning loop. And this way we can hopefully get a better set of uh, small molecules for the next iteration. And at the same time, our model here is going to get a lot better over time because we're feeding it more and more training data from the expensive Oracle function. So this is the, the general idea behind active learning. And here's sort of an example of how this would look like in, in Maze. So we'd have some kind of generator that generates a, a list of smiles. And these are sent to, the, uh, to this model, the surrogate model that predicts scores for all of them. So we have some kind of set of scores and these are sent to, these, to this acquisition function. And this acquisition function decides which uh, molecules to send to the Oracle function that is very expensive and which ones to just uh, send back to the generator eventually. So in this case, we have these two, um, these two compounds selected, or this one selected for the Oracle and this one selected to just send on. And the Oracle does its calculation, sends on the result to um, a node that just copies the result. And this, uh, this result will be sent first to the, um, on the one hand will be sent to the surrogate training uh, node. So we retrain our model on this new score that has been calculated. And then we, the retrained model can go back and uh, be used in the next iteration for the next prediction cycle. And at the same time, everything is merged back together and sent back to the generator. So um, this was sort of the, the general motivation for, for designing this. Uh, so specifically using it in active learning workflows, which incorporate a lot of different types of software. We have generative models, we have some kind of scoring models, we need a lot of sort of uh, what I'm calling plumbing steps in between. But it allows us to be very, very flexible in terms of what kind of workflows we put in. So we could think about putting in um, an additional model in, in the active learning workflow, for example, or additional scoring steps, or deciding um, using some other cheaper scoring methods and then using those scores to decide which ones to send to an RBFE calculation. And so on. So there are lots of uh, different combinations we could do here to optimize these these workflows and make them fit for a very particular purpose. And so there's uh, a bit of software that we've already implemented in terms of workflow steps that can be used uh, right now. And uh, so one of them is is of course reInvent, so uh, a small molecule generative model. Then we have quite a few sort of scoring steps, um, a lot of uh, docking focus here. So Autodoc GPU, Vina, and Glide by Schrödinger. We also have uh, molecular shape matching. This is OpenAI Rocks. So this is a, um, an alternative to, to docking in some sense, and it can be more accurate in some, in some cases. And we have a lot of uh, sort of utility functions. So um, a lot of loading molecules, writing molecules, um, we have an RMSD filtering uh, step, so we can, uh, um, for example, after docking uh, filter compounds according to how close they are to the to some kind of reference ligand. We have embedding steps, so this allows us to uh, um, embed, uh, uh, go from smiles to to an actual embedded small molecule and isomer with 3D coordinates. And, and some kind of atomic state, and uh, things like preparing the docking grids for software like Autodoc.gpu or Clyde. And then the other side is more expensive uh, uh, stuff. So uh, we, we have a fairly simple interface to be a relative binding free energy uh, methods implemented in PMX uh, through an, a previous workflow manager called iColos that we had, that is only for linear workflows. 
um, but we we're working on implementing Gromax as a as a big priority here, and uh, we also have uh, um, some people working on uh, more semi empirical and other niche of things like uh, XDB, Crest, and Gaussian. And among all these other things are lots of uh, utility uh, functions, so uh, filtering data in some some way. Um, sending it conditionally to different branches, um, lots of file I.O. and things like this. So my, my co-worker Lily is, is working on uh, implementing Gromax uh, in this framework. And this is where uh, I mentioned subgraphs earlier, where this can really come into play because um, we can implement the individual Gromax commands, but then of course, uh, normally you'd want to uh, you'd often be finding yourself that you're grouping things together and you're running the same set of commands um, every time you do some kind of action. So we can do exactly this and group lots of nodes together and handle all the copying and, and data manipulation this way and then have very simple workflows at the end that um, allow us to give us a very coarse grained view of what is going on and then make it a lot easier to reason about things. And then on the other hand, we have uh, uh, to my co-workers, Mikhail Asante and Michal Kabyshov are working on predictive synthesis models. And the idea here is that we have some kind of reaction metadata that we've already, already have from, from some other uh, resource. And we want to evaluate uh, certain properties of, a, of this reaction. And so what we can do with, with maze as well is we can uh, uh, start this uh, circular workflow um, that is um, generating confirmers, doing some semi-empirical simulations and possibly DFT simulations to evaluate a certain reaction. And then eventually using this data to uh, train an, an in silico model to actually predict um, the synthesizability of a certain compound, for example. So now I will just uh, switch over and uh, show you some actual code and how you can use it. This works. So, okay, I want you to just quickly go through uh, sort of a classic example, which is um, a simple docking workflow. So the the idea here is, so this is a Jupyter notebook, and we're going to run a simple uh, linear docking workflow. We're going to take a few compounds, embed them, uh, so smiles, and embed them to make them give them actual 3D structure and then dock them to a protein and uh, get the results back. And this is just to show you the real basics of, of maze and, and how it looks like using it. So there are certain things you need to import. Um, so no point in going into too much detail here, but there are certain, uh, certain nodes that are available uh, here that we are going to use, uh, specifically Autodoc GPU and uh, gypsum VL, which is um, a method to embed small molecules. So to go from smiles to different isomers and different conformers. And uh, something I should maybe mention before I continue much further. So uh, I already mentioned, so maze is, is written in Python, but it's also, it's designed to be, uh, um, two separate packages in, in some sense. So it's, uh, we have maze, the, the core package, which is uh, completely domain agnostic. And we have the um, so-called maze contrib package, which contains um, stuff specific to computational chemistry and on the domain specific code. So maze is not necessarily only there for computational chemistry. You could use it for any kind of uh, workflow management. So, uh, I mentioned earlier that we keep our configuration completely separate uh, just for this 
um, example, and because we're running in Jupyter Notebook, it's a bit easier to just show the uh, configuration right here. So this is what it would look like. You would specify, okay, auto.gpu needs specific modules. So this is what you might be familiar with from some HPC systems. You would want to do module load CUDA, module load GCC. So this is basically this, and we tell uh, it where to find the, the software. And this comes in handy when you have software that doesn't come with a fixed name. So Gromax is another example. Uh, you can install with or without uh, MPI, for example, so have a different name. So this is to avoid any hard coding of, of things like this. Now for, for docking, we need to have a grid. So this is already there. And we're going to start by defining our workflow, which is um, can be done by instantiating a workflow object. And we're going to tell it where the configuration is. In this case, we're just going to uh, use this example configuration, which is what you just saw above. In a real case, you would have one file for your, for your whole system, and you can put it in one spot and you may as well always find it there. And you would never have to change it depending on the workflow. Then we can start adding nodes to our workflow. And Mace makes use of the typing features in Python, which are a fairly new addition. Didn't know about them, but basically allows you to give type annotations to, um, to any object in Python. And in this case, Mace makes use of this to determine what kind of data is being sent around uh, from node to node. And uh, I found in, in my experience, it, it can uh, really help with finding errors in graphs where you're sending maybe the wrong kind of data from one node to another, and it will catch this before the, node, before the workflow is even run. So in this case, we're, we have a node called load data, which can load any kind of data, but gypsum as a node needs a list of strings as input because it's getting smiles codes. So we need to tell load data that it's going to load a list of strings. So this is the, the data type for this, for this node. So we just add these nodes, and uh, the same applies for the return node, which is a way of uh, returning the data back to the current Python interpreter after having been run through the graph. So in this case, we can we can set up the uh, the data we want to load. In this case, we are going to dock these two small strings, and we're going to uh, tell Gypsum that um, handling the isom isomers and, and conformers how many variants to generate for uh, the maximum. And we're going to say, uh, tell auto.gpu where the grid is. And we can connect things together. So at this point, we haven't actually connected anything together. We've just said, there are these nodes in the graph. And now we're actually saying, OK, this is connected to this, and so on. And this will be a bit clearer if you look at the visualization of the workflow we've just made. So we have some data loading, uh, some, some node loading data here. And it'll show the data type. So we're loading a list of strings, we're sending them to uh, Gypsum. Gypsum is generating a list of this isomer collection, which is essentially just a, um, a thin wrapper around RDKit molecules. These are sent to auto.gpu. Auto.gpu has two outputs. They're in some sense they're a bit redundant. Um, but because there is always a bit of an overhead in uh, parsing. Uh, parsing conformers from the results from docking, and we don't always need them. There's also a score only output, so this can be a NumPy array um, that just has the scores for a certain uh, docked small compound, and also the uh, list of docked compounds containing conformers. And then on, all one needs to do is run flow.execute, and it will run and give some information. And we can get the, the results of this. Uh, from the last node. So this was the last node we defined, this return node, and we can just get the information out of it. And this is contains the actual um, molecules that have been embedded and docked. So we have a score. In the first case, the molecule failed to dock. And in this case, it worked. And so we have a score, which is a terrible score for docking. And then we can actually visualize this. And of course, this looks a little bit weird because it's a docked, docked conformer. And then finally, I thought I'd show you um, what you would do if you wanted to add a, a custom node to this. And 
uh, what you need is, in this case, we're just, need, we're just gonna need an input and we're gonna need the special node class. And what we do when we define a node, so it'll look something like this. We define a new class and we give our node a name and we subclass from the node class in maze. And we declare an input. And this is where we say what this node gets as an input, what kind of data. In this case, it's a NumPy array. And we have to assign a node, uh, the input to it. <clears throat> and then we always define a, a so-called run function, which just determines the logic that is in the node. And in this case, we're just receiving from this input. And this call will just block until it gets some kind of data. So once it gets data, this will immediately run and we'll get scores. And then the node can just do whatever it needs to do with scores. And in this case, we're just going to log whatever scores we got to the, uh, to the console. So again, we can build up our workflow as, as before, and it'll be basically the same, except that we're here adding um, this, this node that we just defined uh, instead of the void node that was there earlier, which just deleted whatever it got as input. And again, we can run it and we'll see. We just got this logging message telling us what, uh, what the logging scores were. And I think I might have just a few more minutes just to show about one of the uh, other examples I mentioned earlier in terms of um, and using Maze to uh, do some kind of batch processing or parallelization. And so in this case, uh, we can do this with docking and docking is sort of a good example for this because uh, in this case, we're running with auto.gpu, which as the name implies runs only in the GPU, um, but we also need to embed the small modules first, which means that uh, um, Jim practice is, is, can actually be, in my experience, just about as slow as, as docking itself. Uh, so it would be good to parallelize these steps. And this is something that's done on the CPU. So what this means is that we can build up our, our workflow. And I'll just show you the, the graph because it makes it a little bit clearer. So again, we load our data in and we batch it. So we, uh, we send out chunks of it at a time and we run these two nodes in the middle in a loop. So we continuously receive data and continuously process it. And then whatever we got out of this whole thing, send into a node called combine that can merge all of these chunks back together again. And so with these, with this patch and combine node, the uh, interface is exactly the same. So we could combine this into a subgraph and it'll behave just the same as just these two. And this will make it possible for Autodoc GPU to be docking while Gypsum is embedding the next batch of small modules. And this will run just the same. So you finished, Thomas? Uh, not quite. No. Okay, uh, so you are sorry, one, I didn't. Uh, yeah, so you have in the last, uh, you're switching from now. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, so just to sort of summarize this, so I think it might be interesting for anyone who has uh, to work on, on a bit odd uh, software or software with um, conflicting interfaces or conflicting environments. And something I just want to quickly mention is that uh, um, it actually Maze allows you to run, because each node is run in a separate process in Python, it actually allows you to have a completely different Python environments for each for each process for each node. So in some cases, you might find you have. Uh, I've noticed this especially with machine learning. There's some package that absolutely needs some version of PyTorch, and some other packages completely incompatible with that version. You can use them together in the same workflow by having separate environments for them. So that's another um, case where this can be useful, and of course, um, any kind of weird parallelization requirements and there are quite a few situations where you're not completely aware of the 
um, you know, some kind of opportunity for parallelization, but it crops up naturally in the graph. So all the, all the code I just showed is it's all open source and a permissive license, and it's all in our uh, molecular AI GitHub. And I think there'll be links in the chat as well. And if you have any questions on this, you can get in touch or in Gizvi forum, as Alessandra mentioned earlier. So yeah, thank you very much for uh, listening and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Thomas. It was a great presentation. So we have a couple of questions. The first question is from Valentin. Valentin, if you're still there, we will unmute you. If you can talk, you can just uh, speak and ask your question. I think... Uh, Hello, is it working? Sorry. Yeah, it's working. Please go ahead. Uh, I was just wondering, how can you make sure like uh, that you get a small fraction of a, of a of family to uh, of molecules for a specific protein to have an importance in the in the machine learning model. Uh, How do we narrow it down? You mean? Yeah, uh, yes, like narrowing down really specific ligands for the protein, rather than than the like how how can you avoid like the bulk ligands that you don't really need or use. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, the the, the model um, through the reinforcement learning process, the model learns to generate uh, molecules that are actually suitable for the target protein if your scoring function is good. So uh, you can. There are different ways of doing it, right? You you could um, you could sample very small batch sizes and then just wait a longer time, or you sample huge batches and let the scoring functions sorted out that way. So it's super clear what, what is actually better. And then in terms of narrowing it down even further, so I just mentioned very specific scoring functions, right? Like docking, but uh, of course in practice, you would you would use a lot of other stuff as well. So you can uh, start using things like, um, uh, like Lipinski's rule of five, for example, that is a very, very simple one or have some kind of limit on the molecular weight or uh, toxicological models um, other QSAR models. So there's a lot of options there. And if you start combining them, then you're really shrinking the space available quite dramatically. Okay, that was great. So, uh, if I can make another question, uh, is, is it like the gen, you do generate molecules uh, out, like out of nothing, right? You don't get a already made uh, database. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So now the next question is from Cesar. If I will, oh, Cesar, I will allow you to speak if you want. Could you speak? Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. So I, I got interested in how you implemented the FEP on this or workflow. I mean, for if you use a uh, relative binding free energy, you you cannot access to all the molecules because it's relative, it's for the congenetic series. So how do you access to, to run all of them and compare between all these million compounds? I don't know. Yeah, that's a good point. We, so at the moment, what we're doing is we're um, generating based on a um, sort of a constrained inner scaffold. So that means that, that the actual uh, space is sort of fairly limited, and it means we have a good reference. And so the, the uh, steps we take in, in RBFE are going to be uh, relatively small. Right. So that is what we're currently doing, but we're definitely also considering at some point uh, absolute binding free energies to uh, make sort of scaffold halting possible. All right. Yep. Thank you. Uh, MICE is available, right? Uh... Uh, yeah. Publicity. Okay, that's right. Thank you. Thank you. So now we have another question of uh, Erika. Now I will unmute you. So just give me a moment. Uh, I guess Enrica is not anymore online. I don't found her. Okay, I will read the question. Uh, hello, very interesting. Are your treat 
are you treating each frame of your simulation as a single data point of its the entire trajectory per replica? Um, I'm not quite sure what the context was exactly of this, but uh, generally we we not we don't treat. I mean, for for RBFE, we treat the whole simulation as a data point. So uh, we we take um, the case of RBFE, we, we might do several replicas of of the same of the same system, and then treat that that whole thing as a as one data point. Okay, thank you. So now we see. Just check uh, the next question. If it's still is from Bruno, we can ask from Bruna. So I will allow you to talk if you can talk. Sure, thank you. So many thanks for the presentation. I was wondering if you want to implement OpenMM FIP uh, in this application. Yeah, that's that's sort of definitely on my on my list. Yes, <laughs> would like to get this. Oh, great. <laughs> So then we have a question I was trying to, from uh, Bial, I will allow you to talk. Could you talk? Uh, can you hear? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for such a nice presentation. So I was wondering if this maze can be used along with a job schedule or something like Slurum or PBS Pro. Because yes. in an environment where a lot of colleagues are running a job in the same dedicated, like in you know, a shared compute environment. Yes, yeah, that, that was a big uh, a big thing we wanted to definitely have in there. So um, I didn't show just now, but there's a sort of built-in commands for running, um, built-in functions for running any command, and you can uh, dynamically decide if you want to run it on a on Slurm, for example, or locally. And of course, you could run the whole workflow also on, on Slurm, but that's not really, uh, this doesn't really have much to do with, with Maze itself. Um, okay, so, yes, so it's, it's, it all. should be the, I mean, it's not the part of Maze, but it can be done in a such way that, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. We have a last question that I will read because I don't see the person online. Uh, what is the least software requirement to run the program in a normal computer or? Do I need supercomputer to run? It should, it'll run on, on, on any computer. I mean, I, I developed it mostly on my workstation, which has eight cores and a GPU, but it really depends on the workloads you're using. But I don't think there's any real limitation here. OK. So I thank you a lot. I just want if uh, you could stop sharing, I will start again sharing. So I want to have just a final announcement. Um, just give me the option to go to my PowerPoint that disappeared. Sorry for the inconvenience. Mm. So I want just to make an announcement. So we will let the next webinar by Excel webinar will be the 10th of October at three uh, Central European time. And it will be on the competency app by Marta Llorenz Linares. That um, and um, in particular is a competence app that browses competence, career profile, and training resource linked to the bio computational biomolecular research. So by Excel. I thank you everybody for the attendance, and I hope to see you next time. Thank you. Bye.